So I want to just start by doing some housekeeping after this session. Uh, Dave is going to do book signing. Books are over there. Dave will be over here. Here is the book. I've gone through the book. For sure, it's something you should read because it not only takes you through sort of a snapshot of where we are as a country, but more important, it's got very specific recommendations as to where we should be going uh, as a country. So let me thank all of you for coming. Dave, let me thank you for doing this. We've been friends for a lot of years, but I've never had this opportunity to do this to him in front of an audience. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to what we're going to do here. Um, so to start, you've had a remarkable career. It's not only remarkable, but it's very unconventional. Um, you started, or at least my version is, you started by jumping out of airplanes with a bag on, strapped to your back with the 82nd Airborne. Mm -hmm. And then you went and got PhD at Princeton, probably because you couldn't get into Chicago. <laughs> probably. Um, <laughs> And then from there, you went and did a startup in the tech world quite early. When was it in the, that you did the startup? It was startup? Uh, 1996. Okay, yeah. so ahead of your time for that. Uh, and then from there, you went into government and had a senior position uh, under with Hank Paulson in the Treasury Department. And then you became CEO of one of the largest uh, hedge funds in the world. Do I have it fairly good? Yeah. So that's really, you know, that, that's a lot of different things. And the interesting thing about it, in my version, is Dave excelled at every one of those spots. You see the progression. And it's interesting because, remember, that's not like excelling through experience and moving up the same ladder. Sort of try and draw a thread for me uh, around how you thought about your career and how does this all fit together? Great. Well, first, Tom, thanks so much uh, for having me. Thanks uh, to everybody at the Aspen Institute, Margo, thank you, and lots of friends in the audience. So I, I, I'm hoping it's a friendly crowd. Um, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, so uh, I, love, I love to hear you describe that story of my career because it's so not the way my dad saw it. Uh, my dad, was like, what is the matter with this guy? Because I would jump from thing to thing. And when I, I went to West Point, I grew up in a small town of Pennsylvania. I went, to, went to West Point, like I was a made man in my dad's eyes. I had gone to West Point and I was in the army. And when I decided to get out of the army, he was crestfallen. I got out after five years. He said, 15 more years, you would have had a pension. Just stick with it. And, uh, <laughs> and then I went to grad school and I did a PhD and I was gonna be a professor. And then I didn't, I went into the tech sector. and. Uh, one thing after another, and this is not an exaggeration, my brother was a straight arrow, did everything like it was expected. And for years, on Sunday nights, they'd get together. I was not on the phone, and they'd say, what are we going to do about Dave? He's directionless. He can't find his way. And, um, and he just stopped. You know, In my 40s, my dad said, OK, maybe it's going to work out uh, after all. But each of those things was driven by um, kind of this notion of living a life of, that was interesting and, a, and, and kind of a life of adventure. And when I was in uh, West Point, I graduated and I uh, hurt my knee really badly my senior year. So the Army kept me for six months at West Point and I took a course at Columbia on the GI Bill. And the guy who taught this course was a guy named Roger Hillsman who had had a life that was just unbelievable. He had gone to West Point, graduated early, gone to World War II, had rescued his father from a, a prisoner of war camp, came in, started, was part of the early OSS, went back to Columbia, did a PhD, became a distinguished professor, went and worked for President Kennedy, ultimately became the Assistant Secretary of State for President Kennedy. And so he was this, this Indiana Jones figure. And he was up there talking about his life and he taught the course. And I remember thinking, that is what I, that is a career, that's a life. I wanna do something like that where you have public service and, um, and you know, get to do a lot of different things. And so that was, uh, that was sort of the, the guiding light. It wasn't to be the CEO of anything necessarily. It was much more about doing interesting things. So if I knew you when you were 12 years old, would, 
Could I have seen something in you that would have been, had given me predictor value, or did you have a mindset of this is the life I want to live? I don't think so. I, I, I certainly didn't see anything like that in myself. Uh, you know, my dad was an educator. My mom and dad were both teachers, and uh, my dad was very exacting, very high standards. And I, you know, was not, you know, I didn't quite have it together. And sports was, became the thing for me in, uh, when I was a kid in high school but I really wasn't that good at sports. And, um, and so my sophomore year, this is a, I'll take a minute on it because it was a defining thing in my life. Um, I, was in, I was on the bench, I was a bench warmer on the football team, but like when the team was winning big or, or losing big, they'd put me in. And so I'd go in and I'd get the last two minutes, but I would really give everything I had. And I'd, ha I'd play defense, I had a couple big tackles. And the coach got fired. And the new coach came in and he watched all the films. And he kept saying, who's this guy that keeps coming at the end and making the tackle? <laughs> and so the new coach calls me, and he brings me in in the summer, and he says, listen, I think you could be the starting linebacker. But you're going to have to work hard and, um, you know, have a great camp. And this guy was Tom Lynn. He's since deceased. And, uh, and he was a hard ass, just a tough guy. And so I went into the camp that summer between, before my junior year, and I worked, worked as hard as I could work. And at the end of the camp, he made me the co-captain of the team as a junior. And I was dumbfounded. I could not believe it. And he saw something in me, a leadership ability in me that I, um, that I didn't see in myself. And that went on. I became all-state linebacker. I went to West Point. Um, and I remember the first day of West Point, you're in this huge auditorium, and they say, you know, who's uh, first in their class? My hand did not go up. Um, who is president of student council? Who's captain of the football team? And I remember putting my hand up and saying, what but for Tom Lynn, I would have never, never been here. So that sort of put me on a path of leadership, and then West Point built on that, and, um, and that, that put me on my way. That's really cool. I actually have a teacher in my life who made a difference in my life in a similar way. So I look at your resume, and I see energy, drive, and accomplishment, and all of that is really important to success. But the thing that you must have, and yet I don't see it on the resume, is salesmanship. So I want to go off the record for a minute and just ask you, how'd you get Dina to marry you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not, not easily. Uh, not easily. <laughs> Eric Motley's in the room. He knows the story. I won't b belabor it, but just say that the, the initial uh, introduction to Dina Powell was not a positive experience for either one of us because... She was the head of presidential personnel at a very young age in the White House, and I was interviewing in President Bush's second term for a senior position, and my first interview was Dina. And so I'm sitting in the White House, I'm interviewed by Dina, and she recommends that I interview for a job that's working for Condi Rice, and so I interview with Condi. And Dina, who all of you know Dina will know how this story goes, she calls me up and said, you did so well. It was amazing. You really impressed Condi. And then came the next thing, but you didn't get the job. So, <laughs> so like, th th this is like the ultimate, if you pardon my language, the shit sandwich from Dina, because it ends with what she <laughs> thinks is positive. But there's another great job for you that would just be amazing. The president would be so honored. By the way, the president doesn't even know who I am. The president would be so honored if you took this job reporting to the person who got the job that you didn't get. <laughs> and that was the in initial introduction, and, uh, and it, it, it okay. went, went down, 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 uh, downhill from there. But we, we got things back on track many years At later. At some point, you must have <laughs> done a hell of a sales job <laughs> to get the later, yes right. out of her. Uh, OK, so now um, I want to get to your book, uh, Superpower and Peril, but I want to do a speed rating first. Uh, the basic layout of the book is here's why we're in peril, and then it goes to here's the program that we ought to be following if we want to have renewal in the country. So the speed rating, 1 to 10, 10 being high, 1 being low, for the following. How are we doing in K-12 through education, 1 to 10? 3. How are we doing in national wealth creation, 1 to 10? Well, if you're at the top, 10. If you're anywhere else, 3, 2. 3, 2. National wealth distribution? Uh, getting worse, 4, 5. And global influence of the United States? Diminished, 5. 
and finally, political leadership. Uh, yeah, yeah, low, two, three. <laughs> Okay. And that's not a Do you have anybody individual <laughs> that you want to name no. here? Okay. No, uh, no, but this is the, you know, and thank you for saying it. it's uh, a very ominous title, but it's a very optimistic book. And people say, how can, uh, how can you have both things? But the premise of the book and what, why I started writing it a couple years ago, but I, I ran for the Senate recently. I decided to write the book before running for the Senate, but running for the Senate in Pennsylvania reinforced all the things in the book. But it's essentially the belief that you know, we're at a moment, we're at an existential moment where we're in decline. Uh, we're in decline in economic terms, uh, $32 trillion uh, deficit, or debt rather, 40-year um, uh, high in inflation, you know, challenges with interge intergenerational mobility, productivity, half of what it was in the previous 20 years. We're, we're challenged from a national security perspective. The emergence of China uh, is a true threat and a techno-authoritarian country where, if you read the Wall Street Journal a couple months ago, there was a, an Australian think tank that did a study, 44 of the most critical technologies, artificial intelligence, satellites, and so forth, they, they analyzed. China's in the lead in 37 of the 44. And I think we're in trouble spiritually, where people don't believe America is exceptional. They don't believe that we can get things back on track. And I think there's lots of root causes for, for that, which I'm happy to talk about, but you see it in all the surveys. 80% of Americans think the country's heading in the wrong direction. 60% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck. Two thirds of Americans believe their children are gonna be less well off than they are. So that's the moment we're in. And that was the callus for the book because I, all I heard about was why everybody thought we were in decline. And I didn't hear anybody talking about, and here's the path out. And so I wanted to write a book that was about the path out. And so um, it just depends on what we do. Decline's a, a choice and so is renewal. If we have the right policies and the right leadership, then there's a path to renewal. And that's sort of the premise of the book. And if I can make one more, just one more comment on it, people always say, why are you optimistic? Like, why do you think that this is possible? And the, the answer is, it's the American tradition. This is what's happened throughout our history. We get to the edge of the cliff, we pull ourselves back. We get to the edge of the cliff, and we pull ourselves back. And that's happened in the Civil War period, it happened pre-World War II. It happened in, our, in, in my lifetime, many of your lifetimes, in the late 70s, where we were at an existential moment, where we had 15% inflation, we were in recession, uh, we had the challenge of, of the Cold War, we had Desert One, where we lost eight soldiers uh, on the sands of Iran trying to rescue our hostages, a lot, in my mind, like uh, the debacle in Afghanistan. And we had 80% of them, we had, at the time, gas, Lines going around the block. I don't know if you remember 1979, odd days and even days. I remember sitting with my dad in the country squire station wagon in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, waiting for gas. And 80% of Americans at that moment thought the country was headed in the wrong direction, just like today. And four years later, when I was a plebe at West Point, walking across those beautiful walkways, looking on the Hudson Valley, America was back. Uh, and by that, I mean the economy was on fire. We had deregulation. We had a big uh, uptick in military spending, which ultimately ended the Cold War six years later without a, uh, without a shot fired. So I'm not saying we need to do exactly what Ronald Reagan did, but what I am saying is that leadership and the right policies in these moments of decline can turn our country in the right direction. And that is the premise of the book. And it tries to be very, not a particularly partisan book, um, but a practical book about here's what we need to do to get, a, get ourselves back on track. So, that's the country, and frankly, we're only going to be successful in the country if the world is successful. You talk a little bit about American exceptionalism. So we explain to us what that is and why is that important to us and to the world? Yeah, this is, um, you know, this is debated. I mean, I think it's, there's, there's many people have differing views on this. And, you know, honestly, it goes, at least goes back to some degree where there was a speech President Obama made in 2008 where he said, the Greeks think they're exceptional and the Brits think they're exceptional and Americans think they're exceptional. And respectfully, I, I would take issue with that in the sense that America is unique in that it was conceived with a very notion that individual freedom and liberty are the guiding principles for the creation of our, our nation. The nation works for us, the country, the government works for us is, is free individuals. And that liberty and freedom has been the driver of what's made America great. And then by any measure, um, with, with dark chapters, dark chapters, which we need to learn from and get past, uh, America's been a force for good in the world. 
It's been a force for good in terms of a poverty alleviation, in terms of wealth creation across the globe and at home, in terms of human rights, in terms of correcting, self-correcting when it, when it uh, didn't do well, in terms of liberating Europe during, um, during World War II. So this is a country that's not got a perfect past, but has a, a trajectory of, of goodness. And Americans increasingly don't believe that. So uh, just, just recently, there was a survey that showed that uh, patriotism is on significant um, uh, decline. And if you don't believe America's exceptional, then your kids don't grow up, and we all don't believe that we have to do everything we can to preserve it. It's not a flywheel where it just keeps going. It actually requires care and feeding. And so that's the premise of the book, where there needs to be a set of policies that get us back on track, re brings the American dream back to, uh, back to all of us. Uh, but there also needs to be kind of a spiritual uh, reckoning and a recognition that it's only what we make it. And so uh, I'm you know, not trying to preach here, but that was a key part of this. It's policy, it's leadership, and it's spiritual renewal about the role of America in the world. And that's good for the world because if America is uh, a role model, uh, I don't mean that I mean, with humility, but a role model in terms of, of self-correction and self-improvement, yeah. um, that's, a, that's a pretty good role model for, for others as well. So I want to go to the book, but one other question. Would you, would you support national service? You go to the yeah. cultural issue. Yeah, I, I do. don't think of it for, uh, from a military point I of view. I do, and I see my, my buddy Ry Barkat here who started with honor, uh, which um, is, is one example of that. Absolutely. I, you know, there's a great uh, book. I'd recommend it to all of you if you haven't read it. William F. Buckley wrote a great book uh, called Gratitude. And it's about what it means to be an American. And uh, in the book, he's got this incredible line, which is that American citizenship is both a privilege to be born and to be part of the greatest country in the world, and it's a responsibility to do everything you can and must to maintain it, uh, to ensure it, it remains that way. And the book is essentially a case for national service. And I believe that that's a big part of our problem as a country right now, the polarization, is that there's not a lot of common ground among the people that are in, in various uh, places of power. And just to, by way of example, and Ryan knows the stats better than I do, but something like 80% of those who served in Congress in 1950 had served in the military. And today, what is it, right, 17%? 17% yeah. today. Now, why is that important? Because when you have that kind of foundational experience and you're sitting next to someone in Congress who you know served in a way similar to you, it changes everything. And when I was a platoon leader in the 82nd Airborne Division, I had a, I had a, a white kid, Southern Baptist from Alabama, and I, there was a black kid from Newark, and there was a Puerto Rican platoon sergeant who was in, you know, basically in charge of trying to keep a young lieutenant from getting off track. I don't remember what any of them were politically. I don't remember who was Republican, Democrat. I don't remember what religion. I just remember that we were all in it together, and we were there for you know, supporting the country. So... The reason that's so important is we're losing that. We don't have the foundation of history. Our kids aren't taught a foundation of history. Uh, with all the, the black marks, I'm not trying to whitewash it, but it's gotta be a history in the totality that shows what America is all about. And we don't have common experiences. So national service, doesn't have to be military, but national service is so important because kids that grow up on the Upper East Side and go to vacation in Aspen for the summers, they need to spend time with kids that grew up in Bloomsburg baling hay and, and trimming Christmas trees like I did, and that'll make us a, a more perfect union. And so that's why national service is, I think, a critical part of the future. It's not the whole answer, but it's part of the answer. Uh, okay. Thank you. So let, take us through the book. Take us through what we need to do and of equal importance to me is, can we actually do that? Do, yeah. Is there reason to have hope and optimism and forward looking? Well, you know, it's um, at, at the heart of it, you gotta, believe, you gotta believe the diagnosis. So you have to believe that picture that I painted is a real picture, what the things that are slipping away. And then like, you know, any former CEO, you, there's a million things to do, but you gotta pick the two or three things that are gonna make the biggest impact, that are gonna create the momentum to do other things. And so what's made America unique, and, and the threat, by the way, is from, without and from outside and within. So the threat within is that we're, we're corroding, we're, we're, we're losing our strength, we're losing the basis for our strength. And the threat on the outside is China. 
And so when people start you know, banging the, thing, uh, the, the drum and saying China's the problem, well, China's a challenge, but the problem is mostly what we're doing in, inside because we're not maintaining the strength. And so the three things that, um, that I zeroed in on, which I think are the key to innovation in the future, improving productivity, making sure that that economic vitality and the American dreams available for all were, were in three areas. First was education and, and, and our people, say talent. Um, so our education system is, by any measure, failing us. 27th in the world uh, in terms of uh, high school education. Um, our kids that are graduating rel relative to other countries around the world in math and science uh, were in decline. I think what happened during COVID was, was both a curse and a blessing. It was obviously terrible in many ways. But what happened is parents got to look over the shoulders of their kids. They saw what they were being taught. They didn't like it. They thought it was inadequate. And I think that's creating a catalyst, which I hope will lead to significant changes. We see it in many states around school choice that's going to create more competition and more opportunity for all. Ironically, our current system, the, what I believe uh, is most disadvantageous to minorities and blue-collar kids because they don't have the means to make sure their kids have the best options. But it's also skilled training. We, we, my dad was a college president, and, uh, and I grew up thinking the four-year degree was the path to the American dream. That's, it's just not the case, nor should it be the case. There's skilled training that we can give Americans across our society that will allow them to take advantage of great opportunities and great jobs in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, and then immigration. So, you know, two things can be true at the same time. In my mind, our border is a disaster. I've visited it, I've seen it. It's leading to a terrible fentanyl crisis in Pennsylvania around the world. We have to be very, in my, in my mind, very strong and dramatic in terms of curtailing illegal immigration across the border. And we have to embrace legal immigration. Skilled immigration is a key driver. So that's one bucket. We need to get our talent strategy right. And I can talk about the probability of that. The second thing we do is we're losing the war on technology. We are losing our leadership position in technology, and that's despite having lots of inherent advantages. But you know, if you cite, if you believe any version of the study I just cited, we certainly see the gap closing. Even the session we just did a minute ago with uh, James Maniki, he said, I don't know. We think we're heading AI, but we're not sure if the Chinese are six months behind us or three years or five years behind us. So um, that's just one example of where we're behind in part because um, we're not playing on an even playing field. Semiconductors is a great example. It seems shocking to me, I didn't realize it really until it was right front and center that 90% you know, of the semiconductors that we need to make our economy run and grow um, and some of the most sensitive ones are manufactured 90 miles off of mainland China. We basically have no indigenous semiconductor capability. That's a result of terrible, flawed policy, a lack of vision, and we're now we're dependent. On, on the rest of the world in places that aren't necessarily uh, welcoming uh, to the United States. So we need technology policy that ensures that we have leadership. So we need to increase basic R&D, but more than that, we need to deal with the fact that it's not a level playing field. So we need to create policies, tax credits, innovation policy that brings private capital into the things that matter most for the future of our economy and our national security. And the third thing we need to do is deal with data. Data is of enormous strategic significance. There was a, uh, an article in The Economist not long ago that said data is the new oil. It's bigger than that. Data is the driver of innovation. It has huge national security implications. It has privacy implications. Um, we've really lost control. We have no data strategy at home. We have no data strategy with our allies. And data is a key source of our economy and innovation, but it's also a grave national security risk. So those are sort of the three pillars, talent, technology, and data. And policies that uh, promote leadership in all of those, um, they don't cut evenly or nicely across partisan lines. There's not a, a conservative view or a liberal view. There's not a Republican view or a Democratic view. So I'm, as a person who's been in business his whole life, who's a conservative who believes in the power of markets, am arguing for the government to be more involved in places like data, uh, for the government to be more involved in technology policy. And so in the book, I have a section that says, what would Milton Friedman say? And uh, Milton Friedman probably wouldn't like some of the things that I'm arguing for, but my reply to Milton would be, hey, it's not working. We're not winning. And, um, and we, need to be, we need to get out of our boxes and think, creatively and open-mindedly about how to make sure America remains 
at the forefront of all those, those key areas. So we're used to talk like that from people who got educated at Princeton. Uh, let me just ask on the question of chips, if we use that as an example. So we had this incredible CHIPS Act subsidizing the, the manufacture of chips, but it was a huge bill and all of that. What is the government's proper role and what is their, not their proper role in terms of policy to drive technology, data, innovation, those yep. sorts of things? So I want to say two things on that. First, um, the book specifically, we, you say it's uh, uh, someone coming from Princeton. Yep. It, these are detailed policies, but a big part of the book is, is and this really came from the campaign trail to a large degree, the thing that's most important to take away from it, and one of the things I'd like to share with this audience, is how angry people are in places like Pennsylvania. Um, and the fact that they believe that this economy and the policies of this country have not been working for them for a long time. And so let me put you in their shoes for a minute, and then I'll answer this question because they're related. So in their mind, what's happened over the last 20 years, everybody that had assets got a lot richer. You didn't really have to be a great investor. You just need to have something that was worth something because it became more valuable. Everybody that was sort of living on paycheck to paycheck, which is a large majority, most of the assets uh, exist with the 10% of the population. For most people, they were living paycheck to paycheck. Real income was flat. Inflation took away purchasing power. They were dealing with uh, globalization, which was gutting many of the communities across rural America and even uh, in, in some of the urban areas. They were dealing with the fentanyl crisis, which... Uh, knows no socioeconomic class, but has been disproportionately 5,000 people in Pennsylvania last year. They were dealing with 20 years of war, which draws from the third quartile and the fourth quartile, not so much the second quartile or the first quartile. So the, the America they've experienced is very different than the America most of the people in this room experience, myself included, over the last 20 years. And so that's the starting point for, I think, the political discord and the polarization it explains a lot, I believe, around why there was support for President Trump in 2016. And so the agenda that I'm trying to lay forward is not um, just the wonky stuff that you would talk about in Princeton. It's the kinds of things that would bring jobs and opportunity uh, to all of America, but not in a way that uh, throws out the window our notions of free trade and, and, and investment, which have been so critical to our dynamic economy. And, um, and that's the balancing act, because my big takeaway after writing the book, but also campaigning in Pennsylvania, like 30,000 miles in diners and fire halls of VFWs, my big takeaway is, you know what? They have a point. They have a point. It's not that they don't understand what's going on. It's that many of us don't understand what's going on. And so that was my big takeaway. And I try to capture that in a way in the book that is just fact-based. And this is the reality. Now, okay, if we had a magic wand, what would we do? Um, and this is my hope on what we would do. And, you know, I do have some optimism that, uh, that, that th some of the ideas in this book will become reality. The CHIPS Act that you talked about, I don't agree with that. Um, I can tell you what I disagree with it. But I agree with the sentiment <laughs> that we need to do something big to make sure we bring our semiconductor home. I wish it would have been less specific to countries, I uh, companies rather, less specific to com companies. I wish the Commerce Department wouldn't have put a bunch of policies on top of that around daycare and other things, which I think begin to lay the groundwork for traditional industrial policy and the slippery slope of government involvement and picking winners and losers. So there's a lot I wish would have been different, but I applaud the idea that we're going to have bipartisan legislation that's going to deal with a fundamental problem. And I'm also optimistic on school choice. You know, listen, con conservatives have been talking about this for decades, but I think, at least when I'm on the ground, I, what I see is a bunch of people running for school boards. They're active. They're excited. When I talk to the groups that are, you know, supportive of school choice and um, success academies and things like that, I think there's a, a momentum associated with that. And this is coming from uh, uh, the kid of two public school teachers. So I, I'm pro-teacher, man. I love teachers. I don't think they're in a situation they can win. And I think we need to, I don't think there's an incremental way to fix it. I think we need a shock to fix it. And I think school choice is uh, hopefully the way to do that. So you describe your experience with people in, I don't know whether it was the last three quartiles, last two quartiles, whatever, that they're angry and a pro 
appropriately so. Then the debate goes to, so how do you fix it? And there's one side says you fix it with industrial policy and almost social engineering, the daycare that you describe. And there's another side that says, no, we need government to stick to what they can do and leave it the rest to uh, private sector. Do you have like a design principle yeah. of what falls over yeah, here? Yeah, actually, and what falls in the, over in the there? book, um, I lay out a set of design principles, and I I'm specifically say we can't try to be China. <laughs> we're, we're not going to out China, China, and we don't want to be. And we also can't fall prey to traditional industrial policy. We saw what happens when the government's picking Solyndra as an example, right? And that's not a you know that that can't be the future either. And so, um, so I lay out a set of principles that should guide it, but let me give you an example of the kinds of things I'm talking about. And ironically, the Chinese have done this, uh, and I think smartly. So if, if you were gonna say artificial intelligence is an area that we believe the government, or we believe our economy, we believe we're underinvested, and that's gonna be critical to our strategic <laughs> geopolitical strength, to our economy, and so forth, uh, what do you wanna do? There's not enough private capital, particularly going into the areas that matter. Well, there's uh, ideas like creating an investment fund where the private, private capital is investing side by side with the government, and the government says, we're going to invest in this subsector that's so important to national security. And then you say, you know, the government's going to help draw in private capital. How are you going to do that? We're going to take first loss on the fund, and we're going to cap the government's return of 15%. So you've just created a set of incentives to draw private capital, and the private capital is going to pick who, where, who and where they invest. And the government's not going to play a role in saying that winner or that loser. But the government is going to play a role in saying, listen, we can't be behind in 5G. We can't have the Chinese own the 5G sector because that has huge strategic implications. It's that kind of balance that I think we need to draw the best of our private sector into these critical areas, but not have the government picking winners and losers. And so what I'm visualizing as you say that is the process of Congress passing a law and everybody saying, but what about me and what about my district and that sort of no, thing? And no doubt. Can we actually get to that? No doubt about it. But there's, there's moments of hope. Um, you know, it's like it's easy to be dis discouraged. <laughs> so let me acknowledge it's easy for us to be discouraged. But I'd say um, what's happening right now with uh, the China committee that was uh, – Put, put forward by um, McCarthy, and that's being chaired by Mike Gallagher is pretty interesting because there you have a group of Democrats and Republicans, all of whom are viewed as very serious people, debating these questions of how do we think about outbound investment? Are, are we going to kill all about outbound investment to China? I don't think we should do that. Should we restrict outbound investment that goes to the PLA or the, or the Communist Party? Yeah, I think we should. How do you do that? You have a group of serious people from both sides thinking about that question. How should we think about trade? How should we think about what industries? Is every industry strategic? You know, I, I would argue pharmaceuticals is strategic, but is the dairy sector strategic? Right? So how that's about, how about the hotel business? The hotel business. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. We'll come back to that at the end. We'll come back to that at the end. So yes, um, yes, there's so much discord, but at this moment at least. There's a growing recognition of, this, of the significance of the threat from China and a bipartisan um, alignment around dealing with it. It has to be dealt with very thoughtfully, and, and, and hopefully we'll see good examples. So I'm hopeful, but it's a, it's a heavy lift. And we just go into a little bit about data strategy, because that's something that many of us aren't used to. That's a new thing sort of in the landscape. I completely agree how important it is, but how do we, how do we think about it? Because Schumer, you know, did a policy speech on AI and is beginning to go into regulating it, and data is gonna be yeah. at the core of that. Well, it's a, such a huge topic, but let me point to three things that seem obvious and problematic to me. One is privacy privacy standards for each of us individually? Who owns our data? Uh, does it worry any of you when you order a pair of sneakers uh, on the internet that for the next six weeks you get like 52 sneakers advertisements? Where is that data going? You check a box. What does that box mean? Who does your data get sold to? What, what is this? Everything you do now exists online and the privacy you have on it is limited at best and, and who knows? So first of all, we need privacy standards that set 
the appropriate framework for, because data is enormously valuable. I understand why big tech companies want my data. I just don't understand what the terms of trade should be. So that's one that's, that's a problem. I think social media is a huge challenge, a huge challenge. Now, it's a balancing act because I am, am, we have six daughters and I'm worried about the social media engagement of my daughters. At the same time, I don't want the government telling me <laughs> how much time my kids should spend uh, online with social media. So there's a balancing act. But I think the one thing that is well documented is that social media is playing a dangerous role in the eco chamber of ideas. I think there's lots of evidence to suggest a social media is very left-leaning. Um, I could give you examples of why that's uh, the case. But whatever it is, I believe that there should be uh, terms of, of responsibility um, and accountability. And so Section 230, which is sort of what guides um, the liabilities associated with that, I think should be revisited. And I don't think the uh, social media company should be blameless for, um, for what happens uh, on, their, on their platforms. The third is uh, data standards and partnerships with other countries. So uh, data, because of the size of the Chinese population and because of the way that they manage data, the top-down way, China has an enormous advantage on data. And if you think data is of huge value, um, and we're not going to control data top down the way the Chinese do, then one of the ways that we can get compatibility for, for innovation, like what happened with Operation Warp Speed and, the, and the, uh, the vaccines, is through data standards with other countries and partnerships that are key allies. So the Five I countries example, which we share intelligence with, we should share data with. So there should be an international framework for that as well. Those are three things that I think are good starting points yeah. for how we should sensibly deal with data. Great. So I want to go to one more. We'll get to Q&A in a second. Um, how do I describe this? So you described what I'll call an erosion of patriotism. And that is in the world of culture of the country. We had Eric Schmidt in the first session uh, say, in the future world of AI, you should not trust anything other than your direct experience. Because what's going to happen to the, in the world of AI is you won't know what's real, what's fake, and that's going to erode trust. How do we tie that to a renewal of our culture? You know, I, I'm, I, it's, a, it's a big challenge. I don't know. Is the short answer. Adina and I had an experience recently where someone came and showed us a, a, a media, a video of me giving a speech, a political speech, um, except I never gave the speech. It was a speech that was created through AI. Um, it was things I would have said had I been smart enough to say them, but things I didn't say. And you just think about that um, in terms of magnifying the, the absence of trust we have in our society. If you look at uh, all the Pew data, the institutions in our society are, are well below historical averages in terms of trust in our business leadership, in our government, in our Congress, even in our military. The military, the level of confidence in our military has gone way down. So I think this is a huge, huge challenge. And you have the AI problem combined with social media which is magnifying um, the most extreme views, and all of a sudden, you've got a real, real vortex for building, um, building support and um, and a coalition to do the things we need to do. And I don't know what to do other than yeah. to have you know have you stand in front of people and make your case, because anything you read um, these days should be somewhat suspect. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just one more to close us off. Uh, you ran for the Senate, and. You lost by how many votes? 951 votes. 951 1.4 million votes cast. you lost by. <laughs> and what was the name of the guy you lost to? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom, for dragging me through this. Uh, it was uh, Dr. Oz. And uh, when, when we started to think about running, all the political people went, whatever you do, don't run against Dr. Oz, because this guy has 100% name ID. And frankly, you have no name ID. And then Dina would say, yeah, everybody thinks you're a spice. And so um, it, took, it, it took a while to get name ID where I could be, where I could be competitive. But it was, a, it was, a, it was a, an experience, there's no doubt. So as Dave and Dina know, Margot and I have sort of pushed, because from our point of view, 
it's people like you that we need in government. I went back to saying, so what is the process of getting us there? And so from my point of view, I want to nudge and urge and don't get discouraged by that. But one last question, and that is, um, if we take away one thing from this meeting, from this session, about Dave McCormick's mindset, what does your inner voice talk to you about? What is it saying to you? Well, you know, the, uh, well, I'd say two, two things quickly. So when we decide to run, and this will give you a, a window into what, what it's like, because it affects what the future holds, we, we sort of went through a calculus, which was Pennsylvania, purple state, arguably one of the most important states in the country for presidential politics, for, you know, it's the fourth biggest uh, state in the country. And so we said, okay, what's our case for winning? What do we have to do? So as a Republican in Pennsylvania, you had to win the base, the base Republicans. Those are people where I grew up. So they hunt on the first Monday after Thanksgiving and they have farms and you know, they, they, like, they like the military. So that was my appeal to them. But you also have to be able to appeal. This, by the way, is the same calculus for the country. You have to be able to appeal to those moderates um, around the five collar counties around Philadelphia particularly, because that's 40% of the, of the vote. Also the suburbs around Pittsburgh. You have to move forward. Um, we didn't think we need, needed President Trump's endorsement to win, but we thought it would not be good if he attacked us. It turned out we were right on that attacking point. Um, the fourth thing was you had to run in a way that you could appeal to independents and conservative Democrats because it's a purple state. So it's, you know, 49, 51, something like that. So it's gonna, that's where the, the swing's gonna be. And the fifth thing is you have to wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, that person's running for what they believe in. That's a values-based person. That's the person with integrity. Those are the things you have to navigate, I think, for most people in modern politics today. And so that's the challenge. And so why would anyone put themselves through that is sort of the question we get over and over again. And it, it goes back to uh, that, that thing I said before, which is it's kind of, it's kind of up to us. You know, if, if, if people like us don't do it, and, you know, our kids weren't super excited about it, but I would say, well, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Well, what's the worst that happens? I mean, somebody says some mean things and we lose, right? We're going to be fine. But throughout our history, people had to step up uh, to, you know, make a difference. So it's tough. Um, you know, we're, you know, up trying to think about ways to serve in the future and whether we should try it again. But I think the most important thing is what, what I try to say to the kids and what I try to share with everybody is it only is what we make it. And it's not a flywheel. You know, the idea of a flywheel, it's just going to keep going. It's, it's not that way. And if we don't intervene to sort of get things back on track as a country, I'm fearful that it's going to get to the point where it's going to be hard to self-correct. Optimistic, but cautionary in the sense that we got we to gotta do something about it. And in history, it's never been easy. It's never been like these moments where the getting to the right place was easy. It was always messy. Great. So thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go ahead and open it up to questions. Um, yeah. I'm, let's assume that everyone was a Republican in this room, which we know they're not. I can't imagine more than one or two would vote for Trump over you. So how do we get you to run against Trump? <laughs> well, you start, talk, start with my wife, <laughs> <laughs> who is diametrically opposed to any running of any guy. No. Um, you know, listen, the pre the pre it's, what's so interesting about presidential politics today is like the, the, all the rules have changed because you now see that what's required to succeed is not the traditional path. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know whether losing is the traditional path. I, I wanted to tell a quick story. I don't know if uh, some, I know some of you in the room know President Bush, but the day after, um, the day after I conceded the election, we were up super early in the morning because we had promised a friend in New York that we would go to his son's bar mitzvah, so we were driving to the airport, and the phone rings, and it's an unmarked number, and Dean answers the phone, and, uh, uh, which is uncharacteristic because it didn't say who it was, and uh, Dean, this is George Bush. Is Dave there? It's like our first call. You know, we've been up all night, you know, feel, you know feeling sorry for ourselves, and uh, yeah, put it on speaker. So he, she put, he, I'm driving, and she, she puts it on speaker and says, Dave, how you feeling? I said, Mr. President, I feel like I could kick in the stomach. And he said, 
I won't say the whole thing he said, but he said, Dino, close your ears. Feels like you got kicked somewhere else, doesn't it? And I said, well, <laughs> yes, sir. And then he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, uh, my first race, I ran for Congress in Midland, Texas. I ran against guys with Ken Nance, Hans. And uh, he said, I got, I got killed. He said, I got beat double digits. And uh, the next morning, the newspapers said, um, you know, black sheep loses. His dad was vice president at the time. He said it was, it was horrific. He said, but that morning, my dad called me. And he said, George, you lost your first race by less than I lost my first race. Uh, he said, I lost uh, badly to, I guess it was Lloyd Benson. And he said, it was, uh, it was really tough. But he says, I'm not calling you to tell you about my race. I want to tell you about your grandfather uh, who, who ran uh, from Connecticut, uh, George Prescott, uh, Prescott Bush, and uh, he was expected to win and he lost. And he said, so the moral of the story, Dave, is hang in. Oh, and then what happened with Prescott is the guy who beat him ultimately died in office and he got a point. And he said, hang in there, Dave. Anything can happen. <laughs> like, okay, Mr. President. <laughs> so uh, anyway, there's been a long tradition of, of getting whooped in politics and coming back. We, we, we keep that in mind. And the presidential thing, I mean, you know, it's amazing how the field's developing. We, I, I have lost all predictive power. I don't know who's going to do what. Um, but I ultimately believe that the future of America is looking forward, not backward, and I, I hope that's what we'll do. Great. Over here. Yeah, with the white hat. Lou. You talk about national service, and there's been a very steady effort over the last couple of decades to try to move something forward. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you talked about national service, and there's been an effort over the last couple of decades to make that happen. Uh, do you have any sense of what it would take to really push that over, over the top? What does it look like politically? Yeah, well, there was some legislation that uh, Rye was really spearheading and I was publicly supportive of. That was Jeff Coons, uh, it was Coons, not Jeff, uh, Coons, Chris Coons. And, and where, what is the status of that? Yeah, there was a, the first major expansion of uh, AmeriCorps happened uh, about three years ago, and it was a bipartisan bill that Senator Chris Coons from Delaware and then Roger Wicker better than this caucus, uh, Republican and, and Democrat were able to push through, that, uh, that expanded AmeriCorps. Anyways, it was the first major expansion of AmeriCorps in, in the last 20 years, and that, that has gone through, but it's still a diminished, it's less than 1% of Americans right. that serve either in a civilian capacity or a military capacity. So, so that's, the, that's the start. I think the path has something to do with economic benefits that come with service, like the GI Bill and things like that. The problem is that draws mostly the people who need the money. So I think getting people from all walks of society is an important part. I think expanding broadly what would what would uh, could be characterized as national service, faith based, um, not for profit with the right criteria. The reason conservatives typically oppose this, which with good reason, is they're afraid it'll become a political. Uh, jobs program, the, the, the reason the Republicans uh, or conservatives uh, have opposed it. I think we can get through those things with the right criteria, the right transparency, but it's, it's, it's a big lift. And the military, unfortunately, cannot be, cannot be the answer. I wish it was in places like Israel, I think, the fact that there's national service binds society together, and we just we can't do it with our military. It's just such a small fraction of our population. Yeah. But well, she took another big job now, so I can't. <laughs> running your campaign. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, one comment and then a question. The comment is you are getting bipartisanship behind competition with China. Yep. And the great competitive advantage, we've got many competitive advantage against China. I have no doubt about that. And I do think we'll win that, that war, that, that battle. But one of the major competitive advantages we have is that we can attract any talent in the world. The most talented and the least talented people would love to move in, into yep. the United States. That's immigration policy. No one wants to move to China. Right. And so we have the capacity to create the silver bullet, but it seems to be politically impossible. We yep. have just attended a few sessions like that. So question is, do you have a way in which I would just squeeze it through the window of bipartisanship against China? Yeah. Number one. Number two, what would you do in your... Fr oh, the other thing I wanted to tell you is that Bill Clinton was asked at a meeting that I attended, if he were to be president again, what would, he, what would be his primary goal? And he, say, he said, school choice. So enlist him 
enlist President Clinton, who other Democrats do not enlist at all yeah. for anything, for whatever yeah. reasons. So he's looking for something to do. He's looking for something <laughs> to do. <laughs> and it is, and it is, and it is cool choice. Okay. All right, I like it. I, that was a, that's so a kind start of a, talking to him. That's right from now. left field. I hadn't thought of that one. Uh, he might like it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. I, I agree with you on the on the immigration po uh, point. You know, this is, I think, is a political point, but I believe it's substantially. I don't think, I think we've got to deal with the illegal immigration problem as a political matter, because it's a real problem, and I don't think there's alignment and agreement on both parties of the significance of that problem, but I, but I, I believe that. I, I think that also opens up the opportunity to talk about skilled immigration. Now, on skilled immigration, there's a great irony, which is Trump had legislation that he had, he had, developed and proposed in his administration that was moving towards more like a uh, Canada-based system, where it's, it's more uh, directed at the particular skills we need in our economy. I think that's a wise direction. I think there's potential bipartisan support for that. And um, I think the other thing you have to do is deal with what's a very real threat. It's a small percentage of legal immigrants, but there's a very real threat um, from particular uh, industry and graduate students in our universities that are specifically directed by China to uh, steal technology. Um, the, the, that's not 20% or 30%, but it's not zero. And until we recognize that that's a legitimate threat, then you're going to be in a position where you're always um, you know, uh, on your back foot in, in defending the need for uh, legitimate research. But I think the, I think the skilled immigration is the, is the key. And all the statistics are unbelievable, as, as you know. 50% of the Fortune 500 are either led by or started by first generation or immigrants themselves. That's, it's the key to our innovative, innovative ecosystem. So I agree with you. So the question was, what would you do in your first 100 days? As <laughs> I'm going to get back to you on that. <laughs> Forgive me. Thanks. So we're, yeah. they're showing us the sign. Our time is up. Let me give you last word. Yeah. Either give us sort of summary and what would you like, what do we need to do? Well, um, I hope, I hope the, the key takeaway is a message of optimism, um, that there's a path forward, but it depends on what we do. So the hopelessness of the moment that many people feel shouldn't get in the way of the need to engage. And, and, and do our part, and uh, that, that's one thing. And here in Aspen, I feel obligated to say that I think recognizing that the discord we have in our country is, is at least partially the result of the system not working for a huge chunk of Americans, and therefore, we need to step into that and address it, because our ability to do all the things I talked about require us to say, no, that's a real thing. And you know, whatever decisions were made over the last 20 or 30 years to get to this point, that's the experience a huge part of Americans have had, and that's across parties. And so I think we need to step into that, and that's why I think the populism we feel, it can't be dismissed out of hand. I think it comes back to real problems that need to be addressed with real policies that um, hopefully address them. Great. Thank you all for Thanks being here. Thanks for doing this. <laughs>